Big 10 football teams are on the field across the nation. And of course, that now stretches from coast to coast during spring practice. Welcome in everyone to the Big 10 Live Show. It's edition number 55. I'm Mark. We are here at the Voice of College Football. Of course, we got Tim Prangley, who will be hosting our USC call-in show in less than two hours. So mark it down. Don't forget it. The USC call-in show coming up on every Friday night on the USC channel at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 Pacific. But we're talking all 18 of those Big Ten teams, so we should have plenty to talk about, even though early in spring practice, Tim, not a whole lot of news typically because it's kind of, uh, you know, at, at a point when, sure, there's there's information coming from the coaches. They will meet with the media on a fairly regular basis and the coordinators, but difficult to get anything to uh, substantial out of everything that's going on. There was a significant injury coming out of Michigan camp, and we addressed that uh, a number of times over on the Michigan channel, folks. Uh, of course, uh, Rod Moore, who intercepted the big uh, fourth down, or it wasn't a fourth down pass, but it was turned out to be the last play of the game against Ohio State to preserve the Michigan win. Uh, he tore an ACL. He's one of the best safeties in college football and was expected just to take another step. Uh, so a huge blow to the Michigan secondary, especially considering that uh, Keon Sab, one of their other top safeties coming back, transferred to Alabama. So Michigan may be a little bit uh, shaky at the safety position. We had a conversation this week, folks, with uh, Nelson Hubble of Maize and Blue Review. So be looking out for those position previews over on the Michigan channel looking at the maze and blue tim what's going on with you just getting done with uh week number two we have a we have a conference call with lincoln riley uh at 10 a.m no sorry i said 10 a.m and uh conference call at 12 o'clock so that should be interesting probably gonna highlight some things for the first two weeks of practice it's been great i've uh, been able to see a lot of the coaches uh the new uh, defensive line coach coach henny coach henderson was uh taking uh, questions and, um, you know, I've talked to the line coach. I talked to um, Henson, Josh Henson, the, the line coach. So really, those are the two guys. I want to talk about the interior line, and I want to talk about, about the tackles. And I was able to do that uh, this week with both those coaches. So it's been a fun and productive week, um, especially at the – you guys go check us out over on Trojans Wire. I've, I've, I think I've put 10 stories up in the past three days. So uh, definitely go check it out. I've been writing like crazy during spring break. Got to hit that quota, Tim. Yeah. He's a, slave, and, he's a taskmaster, that, that, uh, that <laughs> Matt. No, I'm just kidding. He's been, he's been wonderful. And uh, I know that uh, you are heavily, heavily focused on the line of scrimmage play for USC coming into 2024. So it's just where it all happens, right? I mean, look at, we always talk about defense. It's not. You want to look at national champions, you look at their lines. That's where I think you really, I mean, of course, the quarterback play gets over, over sh uh, shown, you know, it's, it's a huge predictor of how well you can do because it's very hard to win national without elite quarterback. But I think both lines to me, you, know, you want to show me a national championship team that doesn't have strong offensive and defensive lines. I don't mean, you don't be the best in the country, but I mean, you need to have at the very least sufficient and very hungry, mean guys with a mean purpose out on that field on both lines. Otherwise you're probably going to have a long season. Folks, we're loaded up on at Big Ten shows. We've got the Ohio State show each and every week, typically on Wednesday morning, 11 a.m. Eastern time. Michigan on Tuesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern time. We've got the Nebraska show that actually just concluded, even though we typically go on Tuesday nights, we had to adjust this week. Uh, Justin Adams and myself just finished up the Nebraska show. And, of course, Corey Bratta and myself do an Iowa football Tuesdays at 5.30 Eastern time. Uh, Iowa football, the big narrative right there. Uh, we we talked about uh, Kirk Ferentz's latest uh, news conference talking about uh, the offense and the, the defense is so stalwart and they've been running the same system for 25 years that all the attention is given to the offense for good reason. They've been deplorable on that side of the ball and that they now have Tim Lester coming in from Western Michigan where he looks to spark some things. And Kirk Ferentz, we we hold him to his word. He says it's Tim Lester's offense. And to quote Kirk Ferentz, 
he's going to be able to run with it. So unfortunately for Iowa, Cade McNamara is out for the entire spring. And this is a guy that's only played seven football games in two years. So his reliability and the chances that he can make it through an entire football season in the Big Ten is shaky. And the backup quarterback play at Iowa is more than shaky. So I have advised Iowa since, hmm, let's see, before the Big Ten championship game was over to hit the transfer portal and get a transfer quarterback. And I am still advising them to do such. We shall see. And uh, yeah, the Ohio State narrative, we got a lot of Ohio State uh, content coming out. I talked to Pat Murphy from Bucknuts the other day. We're doing position previews, rolling those out. What can you say? Uh, Tim, when you use the term loaded, it typically refers to the offense. People will say, oh, well, they're loaded on offense. But the Ohio State defense may actually be better this year than the offense. They certainly were last year, but better than the offense. And aside from health, I think the biggest question mark for Ohio State, again, offensive line, there are very few teams across America that you just go to game one. And certainly at this stage of the off season in March thinking, okay, well, they've got a great offensive line. They're all set. They're good to go. So that's always a work in progress and a question mark for most teams. So that's grade number one priority for Ohio State. But besides that, Will Howard's got to be a really good quarterback because their defense is loaded. I just do not see where they won't be a top five defense in America and the offense is loaded. So Will Howard, though, is a decent quarterback. He's not a great quarterback. Can he become a much better quarterback in a Chip Kelly system with all the experience he has in the Big 12 and uh, being a I don't want to call him a running quarterback, but he has that dynamic to his game that Kyle McCord did not bring last year. So he does present some things. And as if you have stated many times when we brought up the Buckeyes, uh, for as much as Ryan Day is known for throwing the football around with Chip Kelly calling the plays and with a two-headed monster of Quinshawn Judkins and Travion Henderson, don't be surprised if Ohio State doesn't ram it down some throats uh, to set up the pass. Yeah, they, they, um, they Will Howard, it, it, for as much as uh, people talk about his running, he, he absolutely has, you know, he can make all the throws. He's a big guy. He's got a big arm, but uh, he's definitely not going to, he's not your NFL, prototypical NFL arm is going to light the, the, the world on fire. Um, I, you are right about Chip Kelly. Uh, I, I, I go around and around on this, but Chip Kelly is more than happy to run the ball. People think that, you know, Chip Kelly is just all about throwing the ball over. And that's just simply not true. He, he um, given, given the, the running backs you have, I mean, the strength of your team are definitely going to be Judkins and Henderson. You know, that's, um, that's probably going to be a great competition between the two. It would have one thing, but, you know, with a new offensive coordinator coming in, if they are going to change the offense, that kind of gives Judkins a little bit of an even playing field going up against Henderson, who would have been two years, right? Two years, three years, two years in um, Ryan Day's uh, offense. So, yeah, no, he, well, he, Vivian Henderson, Henderson will be coming actually. up on three. Yeah, this so, will be three. Uh, you know, I've been I joke around with Chip Kelly all the time, but I'm glad USC's not playing Chip Kelly with those three running with those two running backs and a running quarterback because I'm sure that's gonna give a lot of teams fits. The Rod Farva, thank you so much for the uh, the tip here. So this is how quickly some things can happen. We just did a Nebraska show just prior to the Nebraska show in preparing for this show. I always do this. I go to the transfer portal. It's very quiet right now. It's all basketball, excluding an Arkansas offensive lineman. Okay. I go to the commitment list for 2025 to make sure there was nothing dead, nothing. There were, there were a couple guys that we could mention on the periphery for Minnesota this week and a guy for, for Washington, but nobody, uh, really, uh, that's going to make a splash. However, so this must have just dropped in the last hour. We've got, speaking of the Buckeyes, we've got a commit coming in with uh, London Merritt. 
And he is a defensive lineman at 6'2 and a half, 250 out of Bradenton, Florida, IMG Academy. So I don't know if that's where he's originally from, because as we know, these IMG Academy guys are typically uh, somewhere else. And then they come in, of course, uh, for the football training there. He's a top 125 prospect and a top roughly 15 uh, defensive lineman in the country, roughly top 15 player in the state of Florida, whether that's according to 247 Sports or the composite. So good pickup for the Buckeyes getting London Merritt on that defensive front. Thanks for that, the Rod Farba. Sorry, Mark, I was a bit distracted. Uh, someone said my, sorry, off my mic. I was just adjusting my mic settings. I know, chat, let me know if that's any better. And again, we talked a lot of Buckeyes this week. We talked Michigan, and uh, we've got those available. We talked uh, and ran down Penn State on both sides of the football, folks. So the offense, the defense, and those videos are available as well. So uh, also, man, I, I've got a blind spot on the West Coast. I got to got to keep them in mind all the time. So Oregon, we also talked to Spencer McLaughlin, our guy with Locked on Ducks this week. Those position previews are coming out. Spencer and I had a great conversation about Oregon. And man, you run through that defense. People forget last year, Tim. So in 2022, Oregon goes 10 and three. They have a nice season. Dan Lanning's first year, but the defense was pretty shoddy. The secondary was pretty awful. They were if you go to the standard traditional stats, if you go to the advanced metrics, they were like a top 15 defense in most categories last year. Uh, he's really talking Spencer McLaughlin and analyzing the Ducks. He's a bit concerned about the interior defensive front. They're really thin. They lost guys. Uh, they were never really that rock solid there, but otherwise he's really, uh, they've got uh, between Bassa and Jacobs, two of the best linebackers. I was going to say in the pac 12 in the big 10 now. And uh, for a team that you've got to expect is going to be just ridiculous again on offense because Dylan Gabriel, I don't know that he's Bo Nix, but he's awfully close. You could put them in the same category. Uh, I would I would split hairs and say Bo Nix is probably better, but they're in that same tier. And then, sure, they lose Bucky Irving, who was an excellent back, but Jordan James actually outplayed Bucky Irving when he was in the lineup, averaged over seven yards a carry and had 11 touchdowns. Uh, Evan Stewart was a number one receiver in high school football, five-star, uh, caught 40 balls at Texas A&M last year. He transfers into Oregon. Their receiver unit is basically intact with the Stewart addition. They've got their offensive line generally back. They have a few losses, but of course, Justin Connerly, who you know well from losing a recruiting battle there, is a stout left tackle who just went through a left tackle season as a freshman at Oregon, did rather well. And Justin Ferguson is one of the best, uh, Justin Terrence, I might have screwed up his name, Ferguson, one of the best tight ends in college football. So we know the offense is going to be great, but the defense may be just as good. I don't know if Ohio State's name was different or if you put Ohio State's name on Oregon and Oregon's name on Ohio State. I don't know that Oregon wouldn't be the Big Ten favorite. Well, both are coming in with um, well, Will Stein. So I'll put it this way. Will Stein, uh, the, he's, the landing's did a good job the last couple of times he's gone to to get uh, officer coordinators. And uh, Will Stein had, had a pretty good season. Um, I would say, uh, I, I would say that uh, when we talk about how good their defense was last year, they played Washington twice, which is huge. They played USC, which our offensive line was pretty bad and dinged up by the time we got to them. So they played Washington twice. But as far as a schedule goes, I know, I know you use advanced metrics. I'm sure they took in the factor, you know, who they were playing. 
But I'm, I'm thinking back on that schedule and, you know, their, their, their non-conference schedule was pretty bad. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they, they, they miss Arizona, right? Which is one of the better offenses. Um, and, and, and not to interrupt, but that was the game in the Pac-12 that I wanted to see late in the season because Arizona made that run. And actually, if Oregon State would have pulled off an upset against Oregon, or Arizona would have made the Pac-12 championship game. So I, I really wanted to see that game. And obviously, it was not played. And then I really wanted to see Oregon play somebody on the national scale in a bowl game but they got matched up against Liberty. You know, I really wanted to see Oregon, Ohio state or Oregon, Missouri or somebody, uh, but they played Liberty. So impossible to tell anything from that because after Liberty scored the first touchdown, uh, Oregon beat them a million to nothing. So, uh, yeah, I don't know that they're, I'm not trying to tout their defense as being some exceptional unit, but it was a far cry from, them playing a ton of 45 42 games the year before. Yeah, no, their defense is definitely his depth was definitely improved. Um I'm just saying before we make them world beater level, I, I don't know if we want to jump to that level just simply because of the schedule that they had. I mean, chewing up on Portland State, Texas Tech, and Hawaii, and then and then really Colorado before Colorado got rolling. You know? Um well you mean the other way around. They caught they were really Colorado's downfall. Colorado was rolling. They hit Oregon and oh, they knocked, Oregon well, sent them reeling. And, and I, but I mean, like, Colorado was exposed for who, a better way to say it is Colorado was exposed for who they were. They weren't really this, this high. I don't think they're this high powered offense, uh, you know, unless you're Stanford, unless them come back out of nowhere. I mean, but then Stanford's offense was terrible, you know? Um, but they, I mean, I give them credit. They did play, they did play the Huskies twice. And uh, a fairly decent USC offense, but overall, I mean, and the Utes, you know, the Utes were a mess on offense. They didn't really didn't play. They really just didn't play the the the. Was outside of the the best, probably Washington. They didn't play a lot of good offenses, and obviously, they don't play themselves. So, they played Cam Ward. They had a game against Cam Ward in Washington State, and they handled that pretty easily. I can't believe this. I'm is this the roles are usually reversed. I'm I know I'm usually, picking up for Pac-12 defenses. About, you're talking about defenses and I in the in the Pac-12 and I and offenses in the Pac-12 and I'm usually saying no no they're they're really good. Um I I'm again I'm not I'm not dissing them too hard. I'm I'm just saying they have a good defense. I would call it far from a a great defense. We will take your uh, super chats, of course. Uh, we appreciate those. You can also contribute here at the Voice of College Football, as you see on the ticker down below. Venmo, PayPal, and Cash App. That's the most effective way to do it. But we appreciate the super chat contributions. But more than anything, for the next hour, you better get it done now. Give us a call. 888-997-4539. You see it on the screen. Do it the old-fashioned way. 888 888- 997 4539. And you know what? You might as well just tuck that number away because you can call Tim on the same number for the USC show coming up here at six Pacific time. Uh, Nick, I don't hate your Ducks. I think I, if you asked to talk to Mark, I said that the Ducks will be the second best team in the Big Ten, maybe even the best team in the Big Ten. So to say hate, I'm just saying I'm not enamored with, I, I just, the numbers on defense, I'm simply are a, you got to factor in who they played, and you know Nick, you you know you, you the the competition that you played last year. That's all I'm saying. I think that I think that I uh, that you got to be fair on both sides. Clearly, they had a, a solid uh, defense, but it's not like you know they're they were against the teams that had decent offenses. It's not like they were like shutting them out. Is what I'm saying. You know, they gave 27 points to SC, 24 points to the Cougs. Um, and then when they played Washington, they gave up over 30, what, right, in both of those games? So, I mean, they're they're a good defense. They're not, like we always say, throwing it. They're not the 85 Bears or the, or the 08 or uh, Trojans or the 01 Miami or, or, uh, Hurricanes or the 20, what, 2019, uh, 20, 2021 uh, Georgia Bulldogs. I mean, they're not these these insane defenses that everyone talks about all the time. Yeah, and also the Texas Tech game. Boy, that was a nail biter 
is what that was. A lot of the a lot of the offenses they played. I'm, I'm again. I'm going through it. There were serious issues on on most of the teams that scored under 25 points. Like you can look at those play. You look at those teams, and you can see either a they had bad offenses or b there was significant flaws on those on the, in the offenses that they played outside of Washington. Tim, I'd like for you to speak to the comment that LFG, our buddy, is making here. And LFG typically lets us know which like number he is to encourage everybody else to hit the like button. And please subscribe, of course, here at the Voice of College Football. LFG says, uh, look up the 2023 UNLV garbage time highlights against Mission, Michigan. Mayava executed well, made impressive throws, and at least one nice run. Mayava would start right now at some SEC programs. I don't know about the last statement, but the rest of it, I'm, I'm, I'm I, I have seen the highlights of that game. He did come in, you know, and, and throw some darts. Um, but also remember usually in garbage time, you're also not playing against the first stringers on the other side of the field as well. So, um, I, I like, I love it. I mean, I, I love his skill set. He's a big guy. We talked to him this week, actually. He's definitely a skilled guy when it comes to not saying anything. You know, I asked him what, what about his skill, what skills he has that separates him from the, the the quarterback room. I didn't want to say, you know, Miller Moss directly. So I just said the quarterback room. What skills do you have? And he just he just really said, oh, we we all got strengths and we all got weaknesses. <laughs> this is a zero answer. But on the field, um, all some of the receivers were talking about him, uh, j- just about how he uh, he just shows up. He works hard. Lincoln Rye was talking about how he's definitely a film room guy because he's already he's picking up a lot of the offense and picking a lot of it up really quickly, and he's he's a big guy. He's 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 a big dude who's athletic, can move and has a cannon for an arm. I'm really gonna be interested to see what he can do in one spring with Lincoln Riley and see see how this. They're calling it a competition, but let's just see how it, how it unfolds. While Tim asks or answers, I'm sorry, answers my next question. I want everyone in the chat to please leave your default all-time great defense, college or pro, because Tim's defaults are 85 Bears, 2001 Miami, 2008 USC. Those are the three he always goes to. So And 21 Georgia. Okay, you, you did this time, but I know that the first three are always your defaults. You go 85 Bears, 01 Miami, 08 USC. So your defaults, because somebody are, some are already being left. We've got a 2002 Ohio State defensive reference. We've got a 2011 Alabama reference from the Rod Farva. So give us your great all-time defense that should be just the the one we always throw out there. In the meantime, he said uh, that Mayava uh, uh, spoke with uh, you and the rest of the crew there of media. And I know Tim's, how's Tim's mic? Uh, some people have made some yeah, comments and to, Tim's I'm, been I'm working hearing, on that. On my end, my levels are fine. Okay. I don't know why. Maybe it's a, um, maybe it's a StreamYard thing. I don't know. I don't know if anybody has said anything recently. I was just checking. So you talked to Mayava this week. Does he have a shot? to win this job everyone's got a shot i mean we haven't seen enough of him uh, he got some spot time again uh playing through the season at unlv um i haven't seen a lot of his film. I've, I've seen some of his film not, i haven't watched full games of him playing and, and um the the reason why um uh lfg brought up uh the game is because it's gets the competition that you probably would say wow you know but remember again like i said he wasn't probably playing all the starters at that point. Um, I would say that Lincoln Riley seems more than happy with him. Uh, but again, everyone wants, there's, there's no, everyone's favorite player is the backup quarterback for some reason. I don't know why. Just everyone always thinks that, you know what, we bring this guy in, it's lights out, we're going to the national championship. And there's always this hope that if you bring in the backup quarterback, it's going to change everything. And I'll say that we're, we're talking about a guy, Miller Moss, who came in and absolutely lit up uh, the scoreboard in Lincoln Ryan's offense. And, and and it was not against a poor defense. It was against a decent defense. So um, he has three spring springs with Riley, right? He's got two full, you know, three full seasons, three full springs when he's done here. He's, he's going to be, sorry, two full seasons, three, three springs. He's going to, he's going to be able to, um, to run this offense. I think my, like I was talking, I think it was talking with Matt. I can't remember Matt. 
but he, the, you're gonna have to knock him out literally like i'm mean, not figuratively sorry not figure, figuratively not literally because uh he's gonna have to Maya's got to press so much with his physical tools that all that experience and all that cerebral stuff because that's what miller brings miller if you watch miller go through his progressions it's like that he gets rid of the ball doesn't take sacks doesn't require his offensive line to hold blocks very long. He, he check, 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 and get, it gets rid of it. So that's really um, as much as Caleb individually was amazing, Heisman Trophy winner, best quarterback in football last year. He had a tendency to hang on to the ball, which got us, you know, which stalled drives because he thought he'd do it on his own. He'd pick up a holding penalty or, you know, get the ball stripped and a fumble because he's just trying to do too much. Miller's that guy is going to play within the system. And there's one thing we know. Lincoln Riley's system is proven, and, and we have the receivers. Believe me, you guys, I'm watching these guys. Because remember, I said I told you guys about Jacoby Lane. Remember, I told you about him. And remember, I told you about Makai Lemon. I told you both those names. Get ready for it this year. You know what I started to do the other night, and it was one of those things that I I should have just gone straight to bed, but I just thought, you know what, I am always thinking about going back to last year and rewatching games. Now, granted, I only made it about four or five series through this game, but I, I popped in the holiday bowl and thought, okay, I'm going to watch some Miller Moss here because I watched it with like family all over the place and it's on my laptop and I'm not really paying attention kind of thing. So I'm not going to say that I, I gained anything from the first four or five series they actually got off to for as much as he lit it up a somewhat slow start the first couple series mm. in that game uh, so I, I will get back to that but this reminds me that uh, i'm gonna need to jump on those big 10 quarterback rankings that uh, we will get to those and running backs and wide receivers and offensive line we will commit ourselves to all of that let's see what uh, defenses we have represented here uh, Bama 2011, Bama 2011, Bama 2011, the Miami defenses. We've got the Miami defenses. We should know which ones you're talking about. We've got Nebraska 94, 95. We've got, of course, shocker, Moose saying Michigan 23 was better than Georgia in 21. <clears throat> he did say statistically, but statistically. again, okay. You know, we, we, Moose, come on. You, you know that the two defenses and that Michigan defense was a very good defense, but the defenses yes. we're talking about are like, you know, five entire guys going around for 10 years. Do you know what I mean? That's the kind of defenses we're talking about. Five first rounders just in the next draft. I, I should go back and check the next draft and, right. and what could be the next draft after that. Just, just the next draft, just the one draft. Every one of the guys on the every one of the guys on the 2008 SC team I talk about um, was drafted, and the vast majority of them in the first three rounds. So I'm almost positive that the entire 2002 Ohio State defense was drafted. Uh, we've got LFG Bears '85, of course the Giants with LT, and the Rod Favre, of course 2011 Bama. And the Miami defenses as well. A lot of steel curtain talk as well. I tend to leave out 11 Bama and 21 Georgia when I bring it up simply because we talk enough Bama and, and Georgia enough. And so I try to bring in some new, new conversation, you know, into the conversation, but obviously that, that 2011 team was, was lights out. So one thing I was getting to it at one point was just kind of reviewing all the content that we provided for Big Ten schools this week. So again, get to all the team channels, check it out. Uh, and some of the narratives that I had gained, and that led me to the Ohio State discussion about the quarterback play and the defense and the Oregon discussion and so forth. Uh, in light of all that attention going to Ohio State and Oregon, first and foremost, the next two teams that I believe could be capable of making a challenge for this conference would be Michigan. Nobody's going to be surprised by that, but USC. And I know that this recruiting run that we saw last weekend, of course, does not affect this season, uh, but it is notable for the future, of course. And we'll see if maybe that is a <clears throat> foreshadowing of success in the transfer portal that we're going to see here in about a month. And also, you had some news concerning USC's approach 
to the NIL collective. Yeah. Um, if you're a school like USC who loves to be targeted by the NCAA, you, you're, you try to not only follow the rules, but you go beyond the rules. And unfortunately the administration at USC was, everyone knows that you have the NIL rule with collectives that you, you cannot use NIL relationships or contracts in order to induce a player to come to your school, right? You don't want to incentivize uh, a, a, a deal by, and, and have a player come to your school because you're setting up this NIL stuff before there are caps. The idea of NIL initially, you guys, was, and we all know, and everyone's kind of doing it, was the idea that you had a guy come to your school and, and off his name, image, and likeness, like Ed O'Bannon way back in the day on the, on the video game, you know, use his likeness to make some money, right? Uh, it's turned into something totally different. I get that. But some schools have take, took a very literal and very conservative definition of, of those guidelines. And other schools, I'm not saying they cheated. I mean, some of us, we know, flat out did cheat and straight out it did induce, you know, and we're throwing bags of money at people. But for the most part, most schools were somewhere in between. Unfortunately, USC and schools like USC, they had a strict policy of not giving any money or any NIL deals to a student until they were on campus and signed. And that puts you at a serious disadvantage to uh, other programs that had been um, signing people before. I mean, sorry, setting up their collectives had been setting up deals before they got there. So just really quickly, it says, uh, as we head towards year two, this is from House of Victory. As we head towards year two, I want to provide a rather significant update to all those who have stepped up support the House of Victory in the first year of existence. In this rapidly evolving NIL environment, we understood, we understood that the only certainty of our operation was to change in the future. Per previous NCAA and USC guidelines, USC Victory has only provided NIL opportunities to current student athletes enrolled at USC. So until now, you had to be enrolled at USC to get any kind of NIL deal from uh, our collectives. Last month, Tennessee filed a lawsuit against the NCAA, resulting in the federal judge granting an injunction blocking the NCAA from enforcing their NIL rules around recruiting. And then in bold, consequently, House of Victory has now received full clearance, received full clearance from USC to support recruits and, and paid NIL opportunities before they enroll at USC. So see, schools like USC, in the recruiting services, you hear like, you know, all these kids flipping and going, uh, there's a certain school, it used to be the Pac-12, joined the Big Ten, that was notorious for this, throwing large amounts of money, well more, much more money than anyone else was doing. Um, and now USC can join that that fold. And they're able to, uh, through the House of Victory, they got the green light. They don't have to wait till a recruit signs. Until now, we've been saying, hey, get to USC, you know, look at our guys, they're all getting taken care of. They were able to do that, and they were to get some guys that way. But some kids want guaranteed money before they show up to campus, and USC until now wasn't able to do that. So when we look at USC's recruiting over the last three years, and you see some of these schools that are killing it in recruiting, what was their policy when it came to NIL? Folks, I know that this does not involve the Big Ten per se, but I did release a video just a few minutes ago, so check it out. It involves Notre Dame and uh, their new athletic director, Pete Bavacqua, was interviewed by ESPN. And uh, I found uh, some things rather enlightening or was reading between the lines or most of it just hitches smack dead right between the eyes and so i have much to say about uh, notre dame's independence in particular that was the major subject was notre dame being independent why they're independent which we already know but i i may draw a little bit more light to that and then what could be done to get them out of independence and in a conference but why that's not going to happen unless things drastically change in college football so check out the video. I'll drop the link in the chat when we get a chance here. But uh, I, I think it'll be rather interesting to some of you. And you may debate me and uh, not uh, believe my take to be on target. So give it a look. Notre Dame should be in the Big Ten. And I don't even state that in this video. It has nothing to do with that in particular. I'm distracted again by the by the um 
Well, we also have our phone line, folks, 888-997-4539, and it is certainly fresh because it's not being used. Well, um, it's going to be the USC guys. Maybe maybe the, maybe our, our national chat doesn't know how to use a cell phone. I don't know. Could that be. could be it. Could they, be they don't know how to dial a cell phone because everybody's already automatically in their list and they just hit a name. Uh, so they don't know how to dial the cell phone. That could be it. Uh, not that I need more projects and more work to do and so forth, but our buddy Joey Foster uh, guarantees me that this is going to be painless. It'll actually be fun. So he talked me into this one. Starting next Thursday, folks, at noon for one half hour. I'll show up for one half hour, and you can show up as well over on the Big 12 channel. And if you believe you know more about college football than I do, we are going to do trivia for a half hour. And if you can take down the voice of college football, then you get a free gift from the merch store. So I, I take on all comers starting next Thursday at noon Eastern time for a half hour. It's me versus you college football trivia. How about that? Amazing. Maybe we should just maybe we should just talk about USC and Ohio State for the rest of the show, Mark. We can. We can do that. We don't have um, any any Big Ten fans here for the uh, for the for the Big Ten show. I uh, uh, say, caller, hi. You're on with Mark Rogers. Uh, which neighbor are you calling from? Hey, Tim. D Rock Irish from uh, Southwest Florida. Uh, good evening to you and to Mark. I uh, haven't called Mark in a long time. I, I called you, Mark, about a week ago. Um, just want to kind of get a highlight of maybe a brief snippet from Mark. I did not get a chance to listen to his video yet about Notre Dame and joining a conference. Didn't know if that could go ahead and be uh, put into the show tonight, Mark. Uh, maybe in a sense sentence or two if that's possible uh Notre Dame and why it's not feasible for Notre Dame to get into the so D Rock Irish I appreciate you calling first and foremost and so this is going to be a lesson to Big Ten fans because you have now taken over the show and this is no longer the Big Ten live show this is Notre Dame live because you have called nobody else is calling so I will talk Notre Dame football, D-Rock Irish, as long as you would like to. So first of all, let's understand Notre Dame is by far the most important and valuable commodity out there over Florida State, over Clemson, over Miami, over anybody else. So as you understand, it's not that they can't get into a conference. It's, it's that they don't want to be in a conference. And I wouldn't want to be in a conference if I were them either. I don't blame Notre Dame. I would make the same decision. Because there are certain things that I'll say for the video. There are certain things that, that Notre Dame benefits from greatly by not playing in a conference. And now this college football playoff decision starting in 2026 and going forward with the 12 teams starting this season, of course, but the new contract starting in 2026 only further encourages Notre Dame to stay independent. And there could be a couple steps taken by college football to force Notre Dame into a conference, but they're not going to be taken because the powers that be will not cooperate with each other. I'll, I'll say it very generically, and then you'll be able to watch the video and fill in the blanks of who I'm talking about and what I'm talking about. Maybe D-Rock Irish just asked his question and got off the air. Hopefully he was able to hear that because... Uh, that that's my response right there. So again, I, I kind of laid out the framework 
but uh, to know exactly what I'm talking about, just check out the video. And uh, we will get back to Big Ten football. Uh, we do have uh, Tim only here for a short period of time because he's got to get, get himself ready uh, for the USC show. Was was D Rock Irish on the line? Do you know for the rest of that call? He should have been okay. He because because I answered his question, I just kept going and going going, and then he never responded. So I I thought maybe he just asked the question and hung up. Yeah, D Rock, if you're in the chat, uh, let us know. Um, yeah, I sorry, I stepped away for a minute, but um, I just came back and the call was gone. But um, and everything runs through the cell phone, well through the computer that sends then sends a call to the cell phone that runs through the 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 uh, soundboard and then into Streamyard. So I mean that's how the, that's the that's the sausage out that's how the sausage is made. So yeah, the call should have kept going. Okay, no worries. I, I just was curious. Yeah, I mean, I would talk about, let's, let's talk about Ohio State because I'm, I'm going to talk about USC for like an hour and a half later on, so. Well, Ohio State has a situation where they have a litany of could be great players, not great players to date, really good players, like close to all conference players that are five stars. So I'm thinking about their two edge rushers in particular, Jack Sawyer and JT Tuimoloau, who are really good players, but they're not. They are coming back because I'm sure the NIL deal hit because they have something to prove. And they also have something to prove to NFL scouts and their draft status. They would have been drafted easily, but not where they want to be. And they were they were really high. Mark, sorry to interrupt, but they were really high five star um, prospects, weren't they? Oh I yeah, got a high school. Tui Molo like, was the number one player in the country. Wow, yeah, I knew I knew they were I knew he, they were both the number and one. Jack Sawyer was no slouch either. I think he's a no, five star no. as well. Oh yeah, it was a five star. Yes, and yeah. Tui Molo uh, is responsible for one of the largest audiences I've ever had on here. We had like thirteen hundred people watching when he was announcing. Between, I think it came down, it was Washington, Oregon, Alabama, Ohio State. Uh, he played a game two seasons ago in Happy Valley against Penn State. That is one of the best defensive games I've ever seen in my life yeah. uh, for one player. Uh, he batted a ball in the air and picked it off. He batted a ball in the air that somebody else picked off. He had like four sacks. He had a strip. He he ended the game with a strip sack scoop and score. It was just otherworldly. But that's his <laughs> that's his highlight reel. Not that he's not done anything else. He's he's a very good player. But they have those kind of guys that I don't want to say they've underachieved because they're they're roughly all conference players. They're really good. They're just not dominant great players and of course they're not all going to be that right. uh, but you would expect somebody to step out and do that and maybe that's uh the one portion of ohio state's defensive performance from last year going into this year that they could use a little bit more savage of a pass rush it wasn't always getting home and when i say that i don't even mean sacking the quarterback just being disruptive and being what it should be on a more consistent basis but uh the defensive line in terms of run stuffing was exceptional the linebackers and that was a sore spot for ohio state for four or five years were exceptional but they both are off to the nfl and the secondary was better than it's been since like 2019 so well we may or may not continue the, the hold on that OSU uh, you thought because we actually we have a caller caller uh, maybe maybe he's calling maybe he's calling it about Ohio State caller hi what's your name where are you calling from uh, Keith Michigan Keith thanks for calling in what's on your mind um I want to compliment Mark I'd let him know that the uh, calls already dropped I mean the uh, videos already dropped I watched it just before I got here and I also you on your uh, playoff idea last week was brilliant. 
Was that my playoff idea or Tim's? I mi- I'm sorry, Keith. I missed the last comment. He's talking about your your um, playoff um, your, your playoff plan. I'm not I'm not familiar with what he's talking about. I, I'm not quite either. It's been a while since I released a playoff video. It's been a few oh, weeks, but uh, your playoff. Well, well, thank idea. you, Keith. Your playoff idea. Yeah. So, um, in, in regards to to what, what uh, what do you like about uh, my I'm, playoff uh, idea? You're breaking up. Am I on? Yes, you are. Can you hear me? Hey, Keith. Can you hear us? Hey, Mark. Is this yes. Mark? Yes. Hi, Keith. Yeah. Okay. You're breaking up. It's, I can barely hear you. Oh well, that's unfortunate. Um, the only thing I can suggest, Keith, is if you can hear me to hang up and call back, if you would, please. I'll, I'll try back later. Thank you, Keith. Sorry about that. I just realized what I did at the D-Rock. And D-Rock, if you're still out there, call back in. I did. I put, I put StreamYard on mute. And when I do that, then it mutes his phone call. So my bad. I've got, I have a mute on the soundboard, which doesn't, the call will still go, but I, uh, I actually muted him. That's why you were unable to hear D-Rock. That was my bad, complete rookie move. It's been, it's been a while, guys. Well, a while. well I got to say that my soundboard is right here, and it's the same soundboard, as you well know, Tim, that you have, and it hasn't been used for a year and a half. And when I fire this thing up, oh my goodness, like I could barely use it before. I was, I just barely knew what to do, and I'm going to be punching the wrong buttons constantly. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, there's just fun buttons everywhere. Um, we do have a caller calling back. I'm not sure if it's Keith again or if it's D-Rock. Hello. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Yeah. Um, Keith from Michigan. Keith again. You, can you hear us okay? Yeah, I hear much better now. Yeah. Okay. So you were saying? Um, I was, I was saying... Uh, Mark, your video already dropped. I already saw it on the Notre Dame. Uh, a lot of good points you made, and uh, and I will confirm that you said uh, four or five, maybe even six times, you would do the same thing Notre Dame is doing, stay independent. Yeah, I only say that because, well, it's the truth, but also I've got to confirm that over and over and over because I know how many Notre Dame people have come after me. Uh, now, now I can't hear you anymore, so... Uh, have a good night, guys, and I'll try again next time. You're, you're, next you're, show, but I'll keep watching you on YouTube. Keith, you're not able to hear us. I guess um, not. I'm hearing Mark very broken. I hear one half of a word. I get five seconds of silence, and then hear another half of a word. Hmm. Can you hear me pouring my drink? I, don't, I mean, I don't, okay. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure to tell time. you. Okay, All right, Keith. Thank you for calling in. All right. Bye. Bye. Yeah, I um, I really don't know. I mean, again, I know what I did to poor D-Rock. I know that for a fact. I, I messed that up. I put him on mute, basically. When I muted myself, I muted him. Thought I could walk away, but I muted both of us. We've but got... Sure uh, what's going on with Keith? We've got John backstage. So John obviously has something to say here. So we'll bring John. John Diadimo, everyone. Michigan uh, live host, Tuesday nights, 8 o'clock Eastern. Hey, everybody. Hey, John. Hey, John. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I, the call-in, so so Mark, sometimes with your audio, the call-in line is very choppy. So I didn't know if that was a one-time thing or if it's maybe Keith was having the same issue, but um, that might be what's going on there. So you might want to look into that. Uh, Tim was, Tim's audio is always fine. So I don't, so there's, I don't know. But anyway, um, there's some big news today. So uh, since I'm not going to be on the show Tuesday night, Michigan Live is going to be hosted by Mark Rogers, voice of college football, and uh, TJ from Ronan Sports Talk, because I'm going to be at a conference, so I can't do the show because I'll be at an at a uh, networking event <laughs> at the time. Um, but uh, huge news because obviously we had a uh, you know Michigan uh, DL coach uh, Sprugs uh, was not with the team for very long, so Sharon Moore had to quickly find another one. Um, we talked on last Tuesday's show with TJ 
and he named uh, Lou Esposito as one of the four, or actually one of the two that he thought, and Esposito being uh, the one that he thought uh, he heard was a better recruiter uh, out of out of those. Um, so he was he was uh, he. They are expected to hire him. Um, so it may take a week or two because we know how with Michigan's new background check uh, program, the only hire that was announced immediately uh, was uh, Tony Alford because that was probably in the works for a couple of weeks. But, um, you know, so you, we may not get the official announcement for like a week or two, but uh, it sounds like that's who they're going with. And we know that he uh, he was at um, he was only at Memphis uh, for a little while. He spent a lot of time at Western Michigan. Um, so he was uh, he was the line coach for two years. Then he came back in 17. Then he got promoted to the D coordinator role in 19. Um, and he led them to be one of the best uh, defenses in the MAC in 2022, scoring uh, with third in uh, scoring defense and second in yards allowed per game. Why this is important is because Wink Martindale hasn't been a D coordinator in college in 20 years. So even though he is the, the D coordinator and I have a lot of faith in his abilities as an X's and O's coach, uh, I'm, I think that Esposito's kind of college experience as a D coordinator plus his recruiting um, potential, I, I think this was, uh, given the situation, maybe the best hire that Sharon Moore could have made or at least one of them. Um, did, have you heard, Mark, did you hear about the, the news about this, Mark? Or I did not. I'm looking yeah. him up right now. Uh, all I've got to add to that, John, is that he had a 35-30 and 30 record at Davenport, wherever that is. Hey. <laughs> that's, that's a thing? I've never even heard of Davenport. That was from 2014 through 16, so okay. fairly recently. There you go. Yeah, he's saying right. Davenport in there as the head coach for three seasons between Ferris State and Western Michigan. Cool. All right. Um, so yeah, uh, well, that's great. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, it, this means that officially Sharon Moore has completed his coaching staff, knock on wood, every Wolverine knock on some wood he has completed his coaching staff. <laughs> Let's hope for no more issues. Um, so that we can actually Mark start reporting on recruiting news and other things that, that don't involve coaching issues. Um, so very exciting uh, to hear about this. And uh, obviously with the spring game coming up and everything else, it's, it's good that they've locked this in now uh, instead of waiting until God knows when, um, you know, just kind of getting, getting it done now in spring practice. Well, John, you know better than I do that uh, your rivals have wanted to capitalize on the misfortune of the defensive line coach hire, which has absolutely nothing to do with Sharon Moore's competency or anything wasn't like that they just picked this guy out of the sky he was the defensive line coach at wisconsin so you know so anyway that's uh, everybody can make a hire and that was that individual's choice that was his bad decisions that has nothing to do with sharon moore or michigan's ability to hire people now in terms of your attachment and so forth to the state of Michigan. Uh, how how far does that run? Because I've looked up Davenport. It is located in the state of Michigan. I just didn't know your own personal, how much time you've spent in Michigan. Uh, yeah, so I I went, uh, I lived in Ann Arbor for four years. So I, I, okay. I went to uh, the University of Michigan, graduated class of 2014. Um, spent some great years there, uh, had a great time. And then obviously my career took me all kinds of places, but, uh, still try to go back and visit as, as often as I can. And I just was back in, uh, 22 for the, uh, the Illinois game. Okay. So, well, I, I knew that, that you were a Michigan grad. I just didn't know if, if your life had taken you there since or prior to, uh, because Caledonia township is the, the home of Davenport university in western michigan hmm. yeah. there it is well there we go so uh so that's obviously great news and we're hearing uh there are two five stars coming to visit 
uh, Michigan this weekend. Um, so it sounds like uh, Tony Alford, um, despite some saying he's not that great of a recruiter, well, to already have a five-star coming to visit, I know that that's not the same as getting a signature, but it's something. And considering he's been with the school, like, I don't know what, like two weeks, if that, uh, it hasn't been very long. Uh, so I think he's, he's starting off pretty strong and, um, you know, it's, it's time to start getting recruiting really ramped up now that, uh, this hire has been reportedly secured or about to be secured. So, uh, let's get to recruiting and I'm excited when I come back from the trip, uh, that, uh, that hopefully we'll have some, uh, TJ and I can have some news to report for all of you about recruiting. That would be awesome. Yes. So this Tuesday night, as John mentions, uh, John will be out and about uh, with his own career and business pursuits. And uh, I will be hosting the Michigan show. We've got TJ Konerski from Ronin Sports Talk. And we also have Ferris Khan is going to join us as well. So uh, the other piece, obviously, that I wanted to, um, obviously, congratulations to the Ohio State Buckeyes. Uh, for uh, London Merritt. Um, so yet again, uh, Larry Johnson continues to cook. Um, you know, I was talking with uh, Rod in chat here that, you know, Urban's guys, Larry Johnson, uh, you know, you could say Heartline was kind of, he had started emerging then, but really came into his own under Ryan Day. Uh, Mickey Marotti, notorious for being one of the best strength and conditioning coaches. You know, they're still continuing to cook. Um, it remains to be seen, I think, some of the other position groups to the same level as a heart line who just pounds out, I don't know, five-star wide receivers like it's a factory. Like he just, every year there's like, it feels like a, a bazillion of them coming in. Um, but uh, this is this is a good one. And uh, IMG Academy he played at. So we know a thing or two about IMG Academy, right? Uh, JJ McCarthy. Uh, you know, who some might say is the best quarterback Michigan's had since, you know, pre-World War II, uh, you know, so it's pretty, pretty solid university. Absolutely. Is JJ on the top of the board? Have you discussed that? Have you run that through the, uh, the, the fan base here in the last few months? Um, the, the, there was a little, there were two, there were two pushbacks on it there was tom brady who i think people have the the nfl blinders on with tom yes. brady because i think if you only look at his college career it wasn't until that last game against alabama that i thought he really started like balling out at the level that he we saw him do in the at the, at the patriots like that last game he was excellent um but that was one game you can make an argument he had a you know he started going up but Nowhere it, 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 with the impact of JJ and his leadership, the statistics, the winning 27 to one um, and all of that good stuff. The other push, the other uh, counter was Tom Harmon, wh who basically played in another when football was a, it was another sport, practically yeah. like it, I mean, it was very, very, very different to today. And he played like five different positions. So I. I you know, there's there's not a lot of options, uh, but, you know, in chat, if they want to throw another name out there who could be in, at JJ's level, go for it. But he might Jim even Harbaugh. go as high as number two. So it's pretty exciting. I would throw Jim out Harbaugh. the name Jim Harbaugh. Yeah, Jim Harbaugh was great. Absolutely. Um, yeah, he didn't win quite as much, uh, but yeah. when he but he did have he did have quite a bit of impact as a quarterback. It's definitely top five to ten, I'd say. For sure. But uh, yeah. So anyway, everybody uh, hit the like button. Um, and when you're when you're doing your shopping on Amazon, OK, there's a link in every single video in the Voice College Football Network. Go ahead and click that. If you're already going to be doing that, you might as well throw Voice College Football a couple of bucks so we can continue doing all the stuff that we're doing and uh, getting out there in, in, in the college football world. So uh, go do that and uh, and uh, and shoot Mark a Venmo or a PayPal or Cash App. Cool. Thank you so much, John. 
All right. I'll see y'all in like a week and change. Yes. You take care of yourself and take care of business. I'm sure you will. Absolutely. Thanks guys. So actually, uh, Jim Harbaugh was the start of a quarterback run at Michigan. So at the time that Jim Harbaugh arrived at Michigan in 1983, 84 being his first starting season, 84, 85, 86, Michigan pretty much like Ohio State, although Ohio State started to throw the ball before Michigan did. Art Schleister, Mike Tomzak, it was a running factory. Now, if you take the start of Jim Harbaugh in that era of Michigan football, which was he was basically Bo Schembechler's second or third to last quarterback, depending on how you want to go with the uh, with uh, the lefty, I can't think of his name, number seven, anyway, and Michael Taylor with uh, Michigan, Demetrius, anyway. Um, Michigan went on a run of NFL quarterbacks then, uh, starting with the Gary Moeller era. Do you had uh, Greg Collins, you had Brian Greasy, you had Scott Dreisbach, you had Tom Brady, you had Chad Henson, you had Chad Henney, you had John Navarre, and I know I'm not listing them in exact order. I could, but basically Michigan until Denard Robinson and the Rich Rod era hit and Rich Rod tried to transform Michigan into what he tried to transform it, uh, you know, Northern West Virginia, and it didn't work with running quarterbacks and all of that business, you know, Michigan steadily, every quarterback went to the NFL. I'm not saying they became a star. Elvis Gerbach didn't mention him. And, uh, but from like 1985, Jim Harbaugh through 05 for that 20 years, every Michigan quarterback became an NFL starting quarterback, basically. Well, it looks like we're not going to get any phone calls, so I'm going to get out of here, Mark. Sounds um, good, Tim. Thanks for being here. The USC show. Yeah, absolutely. We right. will see you in I'll 45 see you minutes. All right. Tim Prangley hosting the USC call-in show. And uh, that will be, of course, on the USC channel. That's coming up at 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific time. All right, folks. We have certainly gone through our lineup, and we certainly have plenty to do here at the Voice of College Football. So we will probably shut it down right here because we're not getting any calls or stream yard calls or anything like that. So we are good to go. There is plenty of time, plenty of weeks, plenty of shows, plenty of content here at the voice of college football going forward so plenty of time to talk to all of you about big 10 football and of course we will do that at our very best rate you can trust that great to see all of you have a good night be looking out for those notifications as we will be dropping content constantly right here at the voice of college football